country's unbroken circle. We've all heard it said, who's going to fill their shoes? Who will fill the shoes of the country greats like Hank Williams, Loretta, Dolly, and others? Who comes next to dig even deeper into the country music roots planted by folks like Charlie Pride, Bill Anderson, Grandpa Jones, and more? That's what this series is all about. We've asked the country's family reunion artists to invite those who they feel will walk into the next generation, the singers, the writers, those who understand that at the core of country is the same message, faith, family, real life, real stories. And we think you'll agree that country's future is in good hands. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? Welcome to Country's Unbroken Circle. Country's Family Reunion. What a good-looking bunch we've got here. We call this version of Country's Family Reunion the Unbroken Circle. And what that means for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, we're kind of saluting not only the past and the present, but the future of country music. And we've got a lot of country music's future right here in this room, along with the, uh, the past and the present. The circle, of course, has always kind of been the symbol of, of our business. We sing, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? We have the famous Ryman Auditorium Circle in the middle of the Grand Ole Opry stage. So this is just a continuation of country's unbroken circle. And thanks to everybody for being here. You too, Larry. Larry, Larry Gatlin. Don't wake him up. Uh, I'm just practicing. <laughs> Are we boring you already? Oh, no, I just, I just slipped away there for a minute. Yeah. You look but, but natural. I'm back. No. Welcome yeah. back. <laughs> they got you made up nice. Well, we got to sing lots of songs, have lots of music, and lots of fun, and no better way to get into it than to have this lady right here sing a song. And when she gets through, she has got an incredible story to tell you that I think is going to fascinate everybody in the room. She says, stop the world and let me off, but I don't think she really means it. Miss Rhonda yet. Vincent. Set me 
free I miss the wonder of your kiss How can you leave me here like this? Stop the world and let me on I'm tired of going round and round Why play the game of love and long? Now stop the world and let me on Yes, stay up here because I, I want everybody to be able to see you and hear you. What a great job by Mike Johnson and his all-star cha-cha band. These guys are awesome, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> That's it was terrific. a rumba and a cha-cha all in the same song. It's amazing. <laughs> Did you ever hear the old record of that by Johnny and Jack? I went to, I've sang this for as long as I can remember. I guess my dad had me sing this at the dances when I was very little, and I, never, I don't even remember where I learned it from, but when I recorded it years later, I started looking up Johnny and Jack, Patsy Cline, Waylon Jennings. I can't believe all the, the people who have recorded this. Have, I, have you recorded it? No, really? I never recorded it, but I toured a lot with, with Johnny Wright and, and Kitty Wells, Johnny, the half of Johnny and Jack, and he would always stop, and the, the band would do that little break, and he'd go, Hey, stop the world and let me I'll off. have to work that in next time. <laughs> you have got something that's incredibly uh, interesting and about the most, uh, I started to say bizarre. It's really not bizarre. It is a little bit. It's really, it's really kind of out of your element. Tell, tell everybody what you told me a little while ago. Well, you know, it's Larry Black, being on Country's Family, Larry's Country Diner, the opportunities that he brings, you know, things you might get to dream of, like meeting Bill Anderson or, or Larry Gatlin and, and all of these folks that are here today. But something that I, not in my wildest dreams, I would have ever even thought about, um, we have a song, Rhonda Vincent and the Rage, we have a song on the new Elton John, Bernie Toppin. It's a commemoration of their 50 years of uh, musical collaboration, and we're so thrilled that we have a song on that um, that that just came out. It became a number one bluegrass song, and it's kind of an obscure song maybe that you hadn't heard that Elton did many years ago, and, and Bernie and Elton wrote it, of course, but it's, uh, you know, it's just not something that you dream of. You don't expect Bernie Toppin to come to your show, first of all, and uh, he came to one of our shows, and we went to dinner and have become friends for several years now, and, um, and really surprising, Bernie loves bluegrass music and uh, so that's a that's a I was surprised to find that out what a bluegrass fan that he is and, and but that was for us was very shocking and it's like what a what a special honor to get to be um, and Elton's gonna be in Nashville I hope I get to meet him when he comes here so did he actually sing on the song with you he did not it's actually the song is a duet with Dolly Parton <gasps> Another wow. thing that you just like, wow, this is, you know, so fun and always a fun to get so to sing Ronda with her. So Rhonda Vincent and Dolly Parton on an Elton John record. That's right, yes. Yeah, That's sort of. a, Talk about the odd <laughs> couple, the odd trio. What a, that is incredible. It's one of the most unlikely things ever. But What's uh, the name so, of the song? It's called Please. Well, and when they, like Bernie had asked me, he said, I, this is a song I think would make a good bluegrass song. We want you to take it and, and make it your own. And I, when I first heard it, I thought it was saying, let me go home with you. And I'm thinking, I can't sing that to Dolly. 
So, uh, <laughs> you can go I to thought, Hollywood. Dan. Well, I guess. I could. But anyway, uh, so, <laughs> I know. That. Yeah, Hunter Berry had no problem. My fiddle player said, I don't have any problem singing that to Dolly. But I just thought, you know, and then I, what I did, I, I listened again and I wrote the words out. And what it is, it's the sweetest message of all because it says, let me grow old with you. Please let me grow old with you. So it's a wonderful message in this song, and, and I just love it. But it never was a hit for Elton John. Well, I, was, I don't know if it was ever released. It's, if you go and try to find this, it's, it's very obscure. I don't think there's only one place on the Internet that you'll find it, which was also fun because they, Bernie said, I, want, I don't want to do the obvious, you know, the Elton hits. That's, that's kind of the obvious thing, but, but to, fun to get a song that really most people have not heard. Are there other country artists on the record? There as well? are Chris Stapleton and Willie Nelson and Leanne Womack. Um, Miley Cyrus is on there. I'm just glad my grandmother is not alive to see the song title. I cannot say it here. Wow. You'll have to check it out. <laughs> and the name of the album is? It's called Restoration is the, the album title. And uh -huh. our song is called Rhonda, Please. My brothers and I have 18 albums full of obscure songs. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you just have time bought, you can go in there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Did your invitation to be on the Elton John record get lost in the it, mail? It got lost in the mail. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, mine too. He, he emailed me, but it didn't go through. It went right to spam. <laughs> this can't be Elton John. Thank you for John. sharing that story, Thank Ronnie. You. Congratulations thanks for, thanks for on having that. me here today. Always great to see you. I hope it's a big you. success for you. Yeah, wow. That's terrific. Mark Wills, they didn't ask you to sing on the Elton John no, record either. No, huh? I, I didn't get that call. I did not get that call, but it's okay, you know. I, Have I you ever sung like uh, with another artist on a? Yeah, on a well, I see. I did a, uh, I did a, a movie. Uh, 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 I don't really know how to say it. It was a, it was like a child's, um, you know, cartoon back years ago, and uh, we did. Uh, it was Tom Sawyer. And I went in, I got asked to come in and sing with Leanne Womack uh, on a song that they were recording for the movie. And I went into the studio and, and we tracked the song. And while we were there, they, they were like, hey, do you want to read for a part? And I said, well, yeah, sure. I, I can read, so I can try. You know? I read for the part and I ended up becoming uh, you know, Huckleberry Finn, the second, basically the secondary character in, in the, the Tom Sawyer movie. So I got to I got to sing with her and I got to sing with Red Akins on that and we did several other things and you know that was that was kind of cool. Well, now the way recording is done today, were you actually in the studio with them or did you just go in and do your part and then they come in and do their? Oh no, no, we were all there together, which was which is still the way I like to do it. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I there's something about making music as a, as a group. You know, I mean, in 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 our world today where technology is sort of taken over and you can. One guy can play a track here, and one guy can play a track in his home studio, and you know, and email it in. Yeah. I really like being in the studio together. I just think it gels better. It just it feels more like a a real record. I, mean, I bet everybody in this room feels that way, yeah. right? I do. Even with all the technology, the, the technology is great. It's the technology is great, but I mean, there's just something about sitting there looking at you know looking at the guy playing the acoustic guitar, looking at the guy playing the electric and, you know, and kind of feeding off each other mm -hmm. to where yeah. you're, you know, you're inspiring. getting, yeah, you're actually, absolutely you're inspired. Just doing that after 45 minutes worth of traffic that gets old. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> you are right. You're very right. That's why, we, that's why I like tracking at night. I've, I've always wanted, you know, some of the, some of my favorite demo sessions were, when I would go in and, you know, and they would, they would have everything laid down, the band would lay everything down, and I would go in and sing of a night. That's always been my favorite time to do it. And I never got to record one of my records that way, ever. It was always, you know, business hours. Did everybody here feel that way? Do y'all like to, Jenny, you, you like to record at night? Um, well, I used to. <laughs> I'm more of a day person now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but I like to have all the musicians there because... I really, I mean, like you, the steel player plays something and you got to sing. If you're going to come in after that turnaround, you better come back with something pretty good. But Jimmy Caps is always in the studio with me. Usually all the guys that I work with at the Opry are who I take into the studio because I don't like to rehearse. That way they already know it, know it by the time I get to the Opry. Hey, 10 a.m. is for coffee and breakfast. 
Yeah. You know, it's not for singing high notes. Mm -mm. You know, we we never would have a session before the two or the six. I mean, 10, 10 a.m. Who does anything at 10 a.m.? The Army. Put on your makeup or something. <laughs> they do more before 8 a.m. You know, Bill, when I first started. What did you say, Gene? When I first started, of course, even now, that's the only way I'll record. Of course, Dirk Johnson produces me. But we always get the full band in there when I record. But back when I started, I even wanted the background vocals in there at the same time. I mean, Love and Hot Afternoon, Farewell Party, all those songs had the live vocals mm -hmm. laid down at the same time I laid my vocal down. I think it's the only way to do it. The musicians get so inspired over what you're doing, and, and I, I know me, and what they do inspires me, and I think you just come out with a whole lot better cut. David Allen Coe asked me to come in and record with him one time, and I was so astounded when I got there. He had one microphone sitting in the middle of the floor. The band was in a circle around the microphone. David was on one side, and I was on the other, and it was done live like that, and it was great. I loved it. But you just don't hear of that or really see that much anymore. How many confessions, if somebody messed up, did somebody back here go, I, and then everybody else has to redo it? That's the hard part about that. Yeah. Me and Chris did one with Don Helms like that one time. Yeah, we did it the old way like that. It's, the magic is there. A little, yeah. a, a little mistake once in a while is real. Yeah, yeah. And that's something we don't have much anymore. No. It's just real. Mm -hmm. Records are too that's perfect. Too perfect. Is that what yeah. you're saying? Yeah. Well, yeah. that's like the the thing that you and your brothers did, Mogan David. That's what's yeah. just still one of my favorite songs, and I beg you to sing it every time we play the opera together, and you never do, but that's okay. But um, <laughs> well, but it it effectively put the brakes on a pretty good career. Uh, oh, you, no, you, oh, you can't believe it. I, I was, we were vilified, you know. All I was trying to do was write a song about a bunch of old drunks like me, you know, recovering drunk, a bunch of old drunks trying to talk to God the best they could. Right. Uh, and people thought I was, you know, in the chorus, will they have Morgan David in heaven, sweet Jesus? If they don't, who the hell wants to go? They thought I was using the Lord's name in vain, right. which I wasn't. It was their prayer. Right. You know, sweet, hell, that's the best they could do at that time. I mean, every time we pray, aren't we doing the best we can do right then? We wouldn't be praying if we were doing better. We could, we'd pray because we're not doing the best we can do. We want to do better. So a, a bunch of folks, you know, uh, a lot of good Christians. I don't know if they're good ones and bad ones. I don't know. I just guess you are or you ain't. I don't know. But they, you know, wrote letters, wrote, uh, uh, screamed at me, uh, called radio stations. And, uh, you know, we had just had all the gold, right. which did pretty well. Uh, <laughs> and then it really effectively just the, then me trying to have, you know, explain it like I am now taking all your time. Uh, in one cultural center of the universe down in a, a certain uh, state uh, down south a little bit, they, uh, well, uh, German philosopher Hegel said that where they burn books, they will soon burn people. They did that in Germany. Well, we'd, they didn't burn books, but they had a record burning of the Gatlin Brothers album on the lawn of a country radio station. Wow. So I thought it was pretty weird. All I was trying to do is what all of us song are, tell somebody's story. Mm -hmm. Take a story that, you know, needs to be told. And I've taken up a lot of time, but I'm glad it's you like the song. Still, still but if we my, sang it on, favorite well, Gatlin people song. love it in, uh, on, in concert. The next time we do the opera together, I'll sing it and take a chance. I mean, you know, uh, the, it can't hurt the career right now. I, I was going to, I wanted to sing a while ago, I wanted to sing Stop the World. I wanted to sing Stop the World, Let Me On. I'm tired of sitting on my rear. <laughs> Mark, sing us a song. I'm going to sing one of your songs. Thank you. This is, uh, this was, uh, this is one of my, I think it was my first number one record. I think it was. That, uh, you and, and, uh, let's see, Skip. Skip Ewing. Skip Ewing and Debbie, Debbie Moore. Moore. Mm -hmm. You made a great record on it too, thank well, you. Well, it was uh you don't it's a great song. And great songs are, you know, you just go in and sing them. You don't really have to do anything else to it. Kiss goodbye at the 
terminal gate She said you're gonna be late If you don't go He held her tight Said I'll be alright I'll call you tonight To let you know He bought a postcard on the front, it just said heaven With a picture of the ocean and the beach And the simple words he wrote her Said he loved her and they told her How he'd hold her if his arms would reach Wish you were here Wish you could see this place Wish you were near I wish I could touch your face The weather's nice It's paradise It's summertime all year There's some folks we know They say hello I miss you so Wish you were here I've never asked you this, mm -hmm. but when that record came out, did you have a lot of people asking you what it what it meant, how she could get the postcard if a guy was killed in a plane crash? You know, I just said that's the beauty of the song. I really, I, I did have a lot of people ask me about how did she get the postcard, you know, and and I really, I told them, <laughs> I told them it confused me as well. Because, you know, in the beginning when, you know, when we recorded the song, I, I really don't, if it's, something, if it's something I didn't write, I just go with a great song. I try not to overthink it. Um, and, and that was one of those tunes that the very first time I heard it, I think I told you the story. I was cleaning carpet. I was at, my wife and I had just moved into a, a new condominium and I was upstairs with the carpet cleaner, cleaning carpet and had the demo, you know, cassette in a boom box listening to it. And, and as, as that song played, I was like, wow. And I stopped and I listened back to it. And I called Carson Chamberlain and I was like, man, this is a hit. This is a huge song. And back in the day, back when we used to get pitched, you know, cassettes, 
I never wanted a publishing company. I never wanted a songwriter. I never wanted anything on anything that I got. I wanted to listen to the song. I didn't want to be swayed by who wrote the song or what publishing company or anything else it was. So mine always just came with, you know, pitch, one, two, three, you know, whatever. And so, you know, as we, as we dove into the song and recorded it and, of course, released it, people would go, you know, when did he get the postcard? And I would always say, that's the beauty of it. You know, it was kind of one of those God things. You know, he was, he was gone, and that was his last, his last word to her was, you know, the, the chorus. The original title of that song was Postcard from Heaven. Re did I ever, t really? Yeah. Did I ever tell you the story about walking through the Atlanta airport? That song was number one. I was heading to Vegas or somewhere to do a fair buyer convention, and I was going out a day early to, to go to Vegas and do something, and I was walking through the Atlanta airport, and if you've ever been to the Atlanta airport, back in the day, they had those orange lights in the, you know, in the, in the parking garage. And I get my suitcase, and I'm walking, and I see something laying on the ground from a, a long distance away, something glowing. And as I'm walking, pulling my suitcase, I get up to it, and it was a postcard laying on the, in the parking garage that said, wish you were here. And I turned around, and I went back to the truck and drove home. I was like, I'm not getting on a plane this morning. <laughs> and I didn't. I did not go out that day. I, I rescheduled my flight for the next day and flew out to the Fairbuyer Convention in Vegas to go out and do what I had to do. But I was going out a day early, and I was like, no, mm -mm, not this morning, I'm not. And turned around and turn, went home. You never told me that. That's uh, for that sure. Was, that. That, yeah. that scared me. Well, this might be a night, good time for you to explain it to us since you wrote it. I mean, couldn't you kind of let us in on what happened? <laughs> Songwriters have poster. killed more people than Did Cecil they mail it before he mail. got on the plane? I see. He mailed it that morning. I figured he bought it at the airport and put it in the mail yeah. before we flew out. What did you not get about that, Wills? Where did you get it, Bill? <laughs> I got it. I cut it. It was a number one. I didn't have to explain it. <laughs> Works for me. There you go. Uh, hey, Bill. Bill, I have to tell you, though, this, <laughs> hadn't thought of this in a while. I got a postcard from Ben Smathers about six, eight months after he died. Wow. Ben Smathers, the, ben the Stony Smathers Mountain Cloggers the Stony Square Mountain dance Mountain wow. Cloggers. Hal Durham got one, too. Wow. And uh, it said, Hal, and Hal's, he said, I was talking to George Morgan today. <laughs> no, he was, that was in mine. He said, I was talking to George Morgan today and told him he missed your pumpkin pie again this Thanksgiving. And then Hal Durham, he said, yeah, I saw Ralph Sloan the other day. He's still drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, who said that to you? So, well, um, I mean, Ben, <laughs> Ben did it. You know, we all know Ben Smathers was a riot anyway. And somebody said, I forget now, they thought that he sent them to Jerry Bird in Hawaii and asked him to mail them six or eight months after he was gone. But I, I remember going to post, the mailbox, getting them like, oh, wow, I got a postcard from Ben. I got a postcard from Ben. <laughs> Don't freak me out. What did he say? Like, I told you I was sick? No, he just <laughs> told me he, he saw George Morgan and talked about my pumpkin pie. Yeah, he told you I was sick, yeah. That's on his tombstone. <laughs> it's on his headstone. Yeah. Hey, you guys may not know it, but this lady that's telling this story has got the brand new star in the walkway downtown yeah. Nashville. Walkway of the stars, yes. If it Why don't you bring it with you? If it wasn't so heavy, <laughs> I was going to bring it and put it right here. <laughs> so we got some chalk. I'm going to do it before the next, on the next what was, break. You, you had a great line they quoted in the newspaper about about oh, what you at said. The, at the end of my little speech, thanking everybody, I said, you know, I think this will be the first time in my career that I won't mind being walked on. <laughs> 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 and my little four-year-old granddaughter was real serious, and she said, Daddy, 
who wants to walk on Grammy? It's <laughs> like, let me, just let me add them. <laughs> okay, so if people come to town, uh, where, where do they find your uh, uh, star in the wall? Somebody told right? me it's right straight across from the Hall of Fame. I said, I may never get into the hall, but I can see it from here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was an incredible honor uh, and very much a surprise to me. And couldn't have gone in with a greater bunch. Uh, it was Brenda Lee, Ben Folds, and Ray Stevens and me. So it, it was fun. There were some great comments up there on the, on the stage that day. <laughs> Well, congratulations. Thank you Very so much. much. Deserved. You're going to sing a, uh, is this a cowboy song? Yeah, that's why I'm dressed. You can see by my outfit that I am a cowgirl. <laughs> <laughs> Get you an outfit, you can be a cowgirl too. Well, tell me about no. the song because there's uh, a story behind the song, yeah, right? Yeah, this, uh, it's called Life of a Rodeo Cowboy. And years ago, when Hank and I still had the farm out there, my nephew Shane Seeley, who lives in Reno, Nevada, was a rodeo rider. And he and a couple of friends came back to visit. And uh, so about three days after they got there, we were having lunch somewhere, and Shane and his friends came in, and he said, we just came by to say goodbye, you know, and thank you. And I said, well, Shane, are you not having a good time? We thought you were going to stay longer. And he said, yeah, it's really been nice being with you, but he only heard they're riding bulls down in Mesquite, and you know how it is when you're a rodeo cowboy. So I jumped up and hugged him and turned around and got a napkin <laughs> and wrote this song. Really has been nice being with you. And the funny thing, well, Merle Haggard recorded it first, and then Chris Ledoux recorded it. I never got to meet him. I always hated that. And just recently, producer Jimmy Capps just recorded it with Mo Bandy. Oh, so I'm pretty excited about that. I thought I'd sing it before Mo did the show. <laughs> Your own. And uh, oh, I was going to tell you, too, that for years I didn't sing it because it was a male lyric. And then it hit me one day, all I have to do is say he said in front of it. And then I'm just telling you what he said. So I'm going to tell you what he said. <laughs> the 
Breaking, what has breaking, it been, going broke? Breaking Bronx and going broke. Breaking Bronx yeah. and going broke. That's the great thing about great songs like that is that in, in our world today, we don't have them that you can hear one time and sing along. Well, you know, you know it's awesome. funny, ta Rhonda was talking about that coming out of left field for her. Another crazy thing is going on for me right now, a song I wrote in 63, 64, right in there, and uh, it was a hit by R&B legend Irma Thomas in 64. And it's laid around all these years, and all of a sudden it started showing up. It's been in four episodes of Black Mirror. I know the song. You do. <laughs> and it's called Anyone Who Knows What Love Is. And it was in uh, uh, an episode of Big Little, Little Big Lies and a theme song for a show on HBO called Here and Now. It was in the trailer for the movie Moonlight. It's in the trailer for the movie Jurassic World. And um, I just found out recently that uh, Seal recorded it in an album. And I love this. The album's called Standards. How wonderful is that? And then somebody said, wow, I couldn't believe Boys to Men cut one of your songs. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? And I went to YouTube, and sure enough, it's on there. So. Can I borrow $100? <laughs> <laughs> no, your credit's no good, Gatlin. <laughs> your credit's no good. Huh? You know, that's the, uh, that's the thing about songwriting. Larry's a great songwriter. Bobby Tomberlin here's a great songwriter. A lot of mm -hmm. fine songwriters in this room. Jamie Johnson, of course, one oh, of the yeah. best. You don't ever know. No. Where a song is going to pop up. Mm -mm. Uh, you go to bed at night and, you know, it's nothing. And then right. you wake up and something like that has happened. Now, when yeah. it was in the movie, was this the Irma Thomas version that they played? In? Uh, yes, I think so. I think I, in that trailer. Have you ever recorded it? Yeah, I did in, in this CD, my most recent one called Written in Song. Um, I did it in, for the first time I ever recorded it. <laughs> and I'm doing it on the Opry a lot. It's getting really great reaction. And people are recognizing it from, from all the... Well, you know, there are it. songs, actually, that are standards, to become standards that were never hits. Mm -hmm. right. and, and so yeah. maybe that's just going to happen with your song. That's terrific. Yeah, I'm excited. Keep it up, and you can get a, walk, get a star in the walkway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what did it. I T. Graham know. Brown's got a title of his song. Uh, I've, I've never heard this. Maybe I just slipped through it or something. Memphis Women and Chicken. Memphis women and chicken, yeah. Do it every show, love it. You know, Gary Nicholson and the great Dan Penn and Donnie Fritz wrote it, and I cut it in, I guess, 1998. And uh, there's this chart called the Texas Blues and Boogie chart. And it was a big hit out there, and it was a number one out there in Texas. So. Everybody likes it. Well, you associate Memphis with barbecue, not necessarily chicken. What, what's the well, story? Well, hot chicken, you know. Um, I was watching a thing uh, about Beale Street last night, and they had hot chicken. and They got it all in Memphis, you know. But, yeah, chicken. Is there a comma between Memphis and women? No, <laughs> Memphis women. Okay. Uh, and chicken. All right. You'll see when I sing it. You'll get it. This sing would it. probably be a good time for that, wouldn't it, Bill? I'm You'll just guessing. It. You were trying to make it I Memphis, I women, hope, yeah, and chicken. I, well, I, I hope heard, you'll get it. I hadn't heard the song, so I, I did put my it, thing. You know, my with this, the way this mind works, it needs all the help it can get. You talking about mine or yours? No, mine. Sometimes Adderall ain't enough. <laughs> there ain't no commas in song. Oh, man. This is great being here, ain't it? Yeah. yeah. This is fun. This is really fun. Well, boys. That's right. Well, I'm headed into Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee. 
The one place in this world I can get some good to eat. I'm hungry for some loving and some fried chicken. Goes down greasy, finger licking. I know just where to go. There's this woman I know. She shakes it up right. This is Sam on real slow. Memphis women, fried chicken. Memphis women and chicken. Well, now over on Union, there's a good old gal. She can smoke a pig, can fry some fowl. Got biscuits in her oven, cornbread in a pan. Well, I can buy to see her every chance I can. Everybody sitting in here saying, I wish I'd written that song. Yeah, me <laughs> too. Not think of that. It's the first Woo. time I ever heard lips rhymed with barbecue ribs. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, man. Thanks, Bill. Well, thanks I have for a lot sharing of fun that. With that one. No, that was, that's terrific. Did you People find love the comma? That. Yeah, one. Did you find uh, <laughs> It'll be here right after the semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> Gene Watson is sitting next to uh, an empty chair over there and we have fun and we laugh and we cut up and we had something kind of serious happen earlier in the day today. Mark Chestnut was here, one of the great country singers from Texas and uh, I know Mark Chestnut means an awful lot to Gene Watson. You guys have a not only the connection of both being from Texas but I know that when you were ill, when you had cancer back uh, a few years ago, I know Mark was very instrumental in in coming to your aid and your help. Talk a little bit about Mark and and, and the friendship that you guys share. Well, I've always, you know, loved Mark. Uh, he's from right down the road where I am and, and everything, and, and I've always loved his music. And, uh, of course, when I was diagnosed with cancer, well, uh, I didn't have a penny's worth of insurance or anything like that. And uh, so... Thanks to the country music family and every, just about everybody associated with it, they they had several fundraisers for me in different places, and uh, which I was thankful for. But but Seely sent some stuff to be auctioned off, and different ones. Loretta Lynn sent stuff in. Alan Jackson, just about everybody in the business sent something to be auctioned off. So the the fundraisers were huge successes, and they. I like to say saved my life, but the one thing that that meant so much to me 
there was three or four of them that Mark jumped in and they drove all the way from his home in Beaumont to wherever they might be. You know, he'd just show up and walk up and, and uh, I, I just couldn't believe it. And, and every time he would come to me, you know, he'd say, let me tell you something. He said, country music can't do without you. He said, you'd be surprised how many people loves you. And he said, I'm one of the main ones. And he said, anything I can do, anytime, you let me know, and I'll be there. Amen. And I've never forgotten that, and, and uh, just a dear friend of mine. How far back do you all go? You're both from East Texas. You're from Houston. He's from Beaumont. Only in the music business. I never knew Mark, uh, except we had played the same places before either one of us got a break. And, and uh, I was already in the business, of course, when... I turned on the radio one day and heard Too Cold at Home, you know, and and, uh, and I immediately started sorting him out, you know, because he was so close and I love what he did so much. But what Mark means to me is something that uh, you, you can't take that away. He's a fantastic person and I love him. Well, we were looking forward to hearing him sing today and before the taping started, we all said a little prayer for Mark and we certainly hope he's... He's going to be all right. You know, I would think, people might think, okay, here you are a great country singer from Texas, Mark Chestnut, great country singer from Texas. People might think y'all would be jealous of each other or you'd be enemies or you'd be competitors. But what a great story to hear of the friendship, even though, you know, you, you compete for airplay on the radio, you compete in the music charts and all, but, well, but to be friends like that. Very few things get to me, but but something like that does. And and, and Mark, you know, we've worked some shows together and, and uh, uh, just had such a good time because, you know, you put Gene Watson and Mark Chestnut together and shake it around however you want to, it's going to fall out country. <laughs> and uh, we just always had so much fun and, and played to some great audiences and everything. And back when Mike Oatman owned the, you know, the, 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 all the radio stations, and they would do the appreciation shows. And, well, me and Mark worked several of those things together. And and uh, one of the finest tours we had was me and Mark and Ty Herndon did a, a run like that. And I'm telling you, boy, we had them hanging from the ra rafters, you know, and it was nothing but solid traditional country music. And uh, what can you say for that? That's one reason that this gathering right here means so much to me. I get to talk to people that I can understand what they're talking about. You know, <laughs> a, a lot of the new circles, I, I, don't, I don't know where they're coming from. Like Mark was saying, you know, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the new ones, which I want everybody to succeed in whatever they set out to do. I like to see people succeed. But when it comes to recording, uh, Dirk and I was getting ready to do a session one day, and I got there a little early nosing around, something like that, you know. And they said, how are we going to do that? You know, and I said, well, everybody, you know. He said, you know, that's, that's old school. I said, well, I didn't start just yesterday, you know. <laughs> but uh, old school still works for me, and it does for so many people in, in this room, you know. And I try to adapt. Sometimes it's not easy. But uh, we got to have somebody coming along and carrying the flag. Well, uh, we got some carrying the flag that are in this room. Here and before this day is over, we're going we're gonna to show them off a little bit. Right now, how about a song from Gene Watson? For me? You shake it up and it comes out country. Let me get my eyes cleared out. <laughs> well, Those know, of Bill? you that weren't here yesterday, Gene Gene Watson became a comedian at the very end of our of our taping yesterday. So if, uh, a funny, funny side to him. You know, while he's getting ready to, you know, I, a lot of the songs. You know, I wrote the songs that the brother that make the no, uh, you know, and that was just Mickey Newberry told me when I first got here. He said, write, write your song. So I did. But a lot of the songs are co-written, which is wonderful. You've done things with Roger and other people. I wonder if 20 people, however many, have ever written a song together. Let's do it. Let's sit down at lunch and write, <laughs> Country Music Can't Do Without You. You know, it's I love for that. our buddy. What? Mm -hmm. I love we that. could do it in about that 15 please. minutes. Everybody Today write one Gene line. Watson. Yeah. 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 Open in line, well, Gatlin. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Open in line. His name is Gene Watson. <laughs> Well, is or or Mark? Well, he's talking or, about Mark, I believe. Or Mark Chestnut, yeah. or who? That, you know, and it may just be country music can't do without you, a brand new old fashioned three chord country song. What can country music not do without songs? 
So, you know, did it get, kind of do it in his honor, maybe work him in there? I think that'd be fun. This is cool. Anybody got a pencil? Give me my script back. You know, I was listening to, <laughs> I was really paying attention to what Mark said a little earlier about listening to demos and finding material and everything and not wanting to know who the writer was, publisher, or anything like that. When I started out, I couldn't buy a good song, you know. Uh, everybody said, Gene, who? But anyway, I was lucky enough that uh, my manager at the time owned a distributing company out of Houston. And uh, I would always go down there and go through all the discards because he kept all the jukeboxes in the area up to date on what was happening. And I'd go down and I'd go through all the B-sides, flip sides, and album cuts and all that. And the the ones that were sent in that wasn't on a major label and probably would never get heard, and which is the place where I found this song right here. It was sent in, and, and uh, I found it down there digging in a stack of records and everything. It was written by a girl named Nadine Bryant, and I believe she's in Springfield, Illinois. And her sister, Jeannie Bryant, cut it, and I had to uh, kind of rewrite it because it was written for a, a lady and so I rewrote it, and after I released it and everything, Conway and Loretta recorded it, and they recorded it the same way I wrote it <laughs> after I had changed it. So I thought that was pretty funny, but we're going to do it for you because you could know as much about a stranger. Yeah. Our bodies lay here side to side. But our thoughts have turned the other way We make the conversation Of two people who have nothing left to say We're so accustomed to each other We no longer can bother and they You know the signs of clothes I wear And you know how I hold my hair And you can know as much about a stranger I can't remember the last time that I really wore say nothing's wrong but it's here in everything we do so we get up from our bed leaving many things unsaid and that lies the danger many of my words you don't hear and you seldom notice if I'm near, but you can know as much about a stranger. What went wrong? I can't blame it, find the fault. I can't blame it on any one thing. We're so used to things this way. about that song me and Rhonda kept that song as a duet on our your money and my good looks we did, yes. or is it my money and your good looks I don't know you have to figure <laughs> that out <laughs> but anyway it's been a good song for it's me great song well written uh, song thank you yeah really good Gene Watson I don't make country singers any better than him oh, I guarantee you oh,
Country's family reunion. We're celebrating Country's Unbroken Circle. We're going to take a break. When we come back, you're going to meet some new folks that uh, some of you may not have met before, people that have not necessarily been here with us. Uh, my buddy Jamie Johnson's going to sing. Ben Hall, great young guitar player. Andy Griggs, you've never been with us here before. We're going to have some fun. So come back with us on Country's family reunion after this. <laughs> 